In this interview, we're meeting Margaret Burnett and Christopher Scafini. They're both from Oregon State University. Their current research focuses on end-user programming and end-user software engineering. Margaret was the first project director of the well-known collaboration known as eUsers Consortium, and Christopher is now the current project director of that consortium. So let's start at the very beginning. What is end-user development? Um, end-user development is people who aren't necessarily trained in programming, um, uh, creating or tailoring or somehow changing software on their own. So it can include writing new programs, it can include taking an existing program or some kind of software package and changing the way it operates, lots of other things. Mm -hmm. So that's a very brief That's a definition. very brief yeah. definition. What makes end-user development different from um, professional so software development? Well, end-user developers are user developers. They're helping to develop the software that they're going to use. So as a result, they know a huge amount of detail about the context of use that a professional programmer wouldn't. And that's why bringing end-user developers into the context of development helps to produce better products. Maybe yeah. there's one other aspect that we have to add too, mm -hmm. and that's that um, professional software developers are trained to develop software, and end-user developers usually don't have that kind of training. Yeah, who are the end-users? Well, um, there's a huge uh, population of possible developers. So one classic example is accountants creating their own spreadsheets. And the way they do that is they not only put data into these cells uh, in spreadsheets like Excel, but they also put in formulas. And a formula is actually an instruction to the computer on how it's supposed to compute things given whatever inputs you later on put in. And so that's actually a program. So accountants who, anybody who's using Excel formulas, accountants or anybody else, um, count as end-user developers. There are lots of other situations uh, in which they're end-user developers too, but Excel is maybe the example that most people are most familiar with. Okay. So what is the difference between end-user development, end-user end programming, and end-user software engineering? Um, okay, so these are three terms that are very widely used and they're quite similar. But end-user programming is more specific than end-user development. So if we can imagine uh, a Venn diagram, uh, a circle, then end-user programming is here and end-user development surrounds it and is much bigger. And I'll talk about end-user software engineering in a minute. So, okay, so end-user programming is actually creating, this means going from nothing to something, uh, creating a new program. And end-user programming research is the oldest of all of these and has been going on for quite a while. Um, end user development says, oh wait, we understand from our background in computer science that in fact software development is more than just creating new programs. There are many other aspects to the software lifecycle, things like debugging and testing and designing and reusing and sharing. So end user development considers the entire software lifecycle, not just the create new programs part. So that's why it surrounds end user programming, but is much larger. End user and end user development is a much newer concept. End user programming is the one that goes back to the 70s. End user development is much newer. And then end user software engineering um, also, like end user development, con considers the entire software lifecycle, but it adds a notion of quality. Um, and which notion it adds is up to the researcher. It could be the. And the user. And the user, right? Um, and so it could be. Um, the correctness of the software's answers, or it could be the maintainability, or it could be the reusability. I mean, there are many possible notions of quality, but that's what end-user software engineering is all about, is adding some notion of quality to end-user development. So in your opinion, uh, what is the most important reason for focusing on and developing methods and tools and, and uh, knowledge about end-user development? Well, there's just so many of them. You know, every one of the six billion people on earth could be an end-user developer. And they don't all have appropriate systems for participating in the development of software right now. But that's the potential impact. And even today, we've done a study of uh, what it looks like in the United States. And about 90 million people 
are participating in this, at least as end users, and maybe half of them as end user developers of one sort or another. And this is compared to maybe 3 million professional programmers. So, you know, that's a ratio of 15 to 1. And so you could produce, and we do produce, great tools for professional developers, and they make great software which goes on to help people. But there's this alternative route where you can reach directly into the lives of end-user developers and give them the ability to build tools for themselves or to extend software that other people have created for them. And so it gives you a direct hand in helping potentially the entire world. Not everybody's going to be a professional programmer. No, and I imagine there must be more difference in these end users than there will be in the professional. There really is. There's yeah. a, this is a huge space, actually. There's um, lots of many different types of software and software development tools that are waiting to be explored and produced. Um, this is a, an enormous commercial space that's only really beginning to be explored. And there's a very large number of specific subgroups within this population which are waiting to be explored by researchers. So, you know, it's it's definitely an exciting area to be working in right now. And, and Chris has mentioned the diversity of the, the kinds of tools and the kinds of domains. There's also a huge diversity in the kinds of people that might want to participate and the extent to which they'd want to participate in the way they'd want to participate. So, um, yes, it's a, it's a multidimensional space. Let's take a short look at the history. When and how did research into end-user development start? Um, okay, so it started with end-user programming. Um, there was a little bit of work in the 60s, but it really started to take off a lot more in the 70s. And at that time, the vision was that end-users would create their own programs. At first, the thought was they would create their own programs in a way kind of similar to the way professional programmers do. And so there were flowchart languages in which um, there were little graphical pictures instead of the words that we tr traditionally use and, and some other approaches, some of which were more successful than others. And then things got a lot more inventive and they invented entirely new paradigms for creating programs, such as programming by demonstration, which was specifically invented for end users. And some of that actually has come back to help professional programmers as well. Anyway, so end user programming was an exciting and big area for quite a while, especially in the 70s and also in the, the 80s. But then um, people kind of got discouraged because, perhaps because it was noticed that although end users can create their own programs using some of these approaches, and of course Excel uh, and other spreadsheets, which was a, a huge factor in people being able to do this, but it was noticed that sometimes these programs they created weren't working out so very well. And so the, the magic and the excitement and the discovery sort of started to fall off and people got a little bit discouraged. Uh, then in the late 90s, uh, sort of simultaneously, end user development and end user software engineering sprang up. And as I've mentioned before, both of those consider the entire software life cycle. And this, although it seems kind of obvious in retrospect, was a huge boost to the whole notion of end users being involved in programming. Suddenly people said, yeah, they have to be able to debug. We have to get serious about this sort of thing. Uh, they have to be able to really think seriously about how to, uh, how to test. But at the same time, we have these challenges. We can't just take what professional software developers have done and just uh, sort of graft them into end user programming environments because end users often don't have the same training or motivations as professional software developers. So this big space of interesting research questions that helped solve the problems that were making end user programming folks start getting discouraged came with end user development and end user software engineering. So anyway, so those things uh, sprang up in the late 90s simultaneously and started really entirely new research sub areas that really sprang uh, into life. So I did some Google searches on words like end user development, end user software engineering, um, limiting the the date range to something like 1998. And there were a very small handful of papers that talked about concepts like that. And then by, uh, well, by roughly now, the number of papers that were talking about those things uh, greatly expanded to the thousands. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, it's, it's really taken off. And, and end user programming, of course, has also become kind of revitalized too because it's all integrated into the same thing now. Excellent. So what is the most interesting and fascinating aspect of end user development? Um, I'd say right now that the broadening of different kinds of quality that are considered by the researchers is one key area. So um, Margaret mentioned that there are lots of different aspects of quality. And I, I think um, maybe just functional correctness has been the main focus, which isn't exactly a, a traditional quality attribute. And the quality attributes generally are regarded as the non-functional characteristics of the code, like its speed and memory use and um, maintainability and testability and so forth. And we're only now beginning to explore some of these other aspects of software, at least in the context of end user development. So, um, you know, I think having giving users the ability to make reusable software without having to do the massive amount of upfront design that a professional programmer does. What do you mean by that reusable software? So reusability is the concept of being able to take something you've already created and combine those pieces or possibly extend them or modify them in order to create a new thing. So um, this is one of the main tools of professional software developers. One of the reasons why it's possible to create really wonderful software at an affordable price right now. And end users, because they're designing for their own use, design for the use case of the moment. And as a result, their software often isn't very reusable. And so we need to rethink exactly what it means to reuse that software. They're not going to be creating little components that can then be hooked together into something bigger later. There's going to be a, a much more intensive restructuring of the code that will be necessary. And end user developers don't necessarily want to invest all of that effort into intensive restructuring. So they'll need better support for that process. And uh, just as another example, end users, because they don't always have the same level of training as professional programmers, and because they're so diverse, they often make code that's extremely bad. Okay, It could be bad in many ways. For instance, it could, it could have a security hole. And so um, that maybe is not a very good piece of code to reuse in a new context, right? Especially if someone else wrote that code, you know, if another end user you wrote that code for his own use, maybe you don't want to use that code. But right now it's very hard for one user to perceive the flaws in another user's code very easily. So this is a very challenging problem. Mm -hmm. And we'll need to overcome this if uh, we want to broaden the base of people who are participating effectively in end user development. I think, um, I think I might add to this too, um, another thing that's quite interesting about end user development is the areas that it applies to that one might not think it applies to. So for example, professional uh, developers worry a lot about things like privacy and security. And so they give users various kinds of settings, like Facebook has settings and um, uh, yeah, there are all kinds of settings that have to do with rules. Uh, things that, you know, tailor the way your software is, and some of them have to do with privacy. Well, um, those of us in end-user development think of these as a form of an end-user program, because when you use, when you have a collection of rules, sometimes it's scattered out too. You know, you have rules in Facebook, and you have rules over here, and you have rules over here, and you have rules on your operating system. But, but this collection of, of rules or constraints is an example of a program because it's instructing the computer about how to compute no matter what input comes in, and that's what programs do. And so viewing those kinds of problems as end-user development problems really helps us to understand the nature of the problem much better than if we just view it as a simple user interface problem because that makes us understand that yeah, there are questions about reuse, like the kinds that Chris mm -hmm. brought up, and there are also questions about how to debug and test it, and all of these things we might not have thought of if we didn't view it through the, end of, the lens of end-user development. So that's, you know, that's another very interesting aspect of it. It's not as narrow a field as some people might think it is. Yeah, end-user development brings a life cycle and contextual perspective to the problem that end-user programming by itself doesn't afford. And so as a result, you can really see how it's fitting into the lives that these people are experiencing and how the software evolves in parallel with the human beings' mm -hmm. lives. 
And that presents a more realistic and challenging problem for us to solve. It's, it's not Could you something. describe an example of this uh, cycle? Well, here's an example that happens every day in organizations all around the world. As soon as Microsoft Excel is installed and people start making spreadsheets, maybe for an annual report or a quarterly report, it's got a whole bunch of computations in it. That's used to generate a report and then the next quarter comes. I guarantee to you that they are not going to start from scratch on the next report. They're going to look at the previous report as guidance for how to make the new one. They may even take that old spreadsheet and put it into the new context. But it's possible that maybe they now have slightly different products. So you have to add and remove rows, maybe restructure the spreadsheet a little. Maybe you decide that this old chart wasn't exactly what you want to show. You want to show this like different thing. And now you've got a maintenance problem and a reuse problem. And it could be further complicated by the fact that the person who does this report might be a different person than the one who did that report. And at the same time, not in this example, but in other examples, you can imagine many people making modifications of the same spreadsheet and customizing it for different situations in parallel with one another. Over the course of many years then, you have a very serious problem about tracking all of the relationships among those. And if you find an error in one of them, how does that relate to the correctness of the other spreadsheets and so forth. So here we have an example where the spreadsheet is making getting made into copies and evolving over the life, its life cycle is occurring in parallel with the life of an entire organization and many people. So it can be a very complex and rich problem. Can you give us some examples of some methods and theories and tools you use in your work? Yes. In fact, it's kind of hard to, be, to even start figuring out where to begin. So end-user development, end-user programming, end-user software engineering, uh, all of these related concepts actually are rooted in several different older areas. So we have roots in software engineering, we have roots in human-computer interaction, and we have roots in education. And so we borrow many of the methods and theories and, and methodologies and backgrounds from all of those areas. So for example, um, human-computer interaction itself has roots in older fields such as psychology. And so there's some work that borrowed from some very interesting findings in the psychology of curiosity. And, and that came forward to help solve some problems in end user development. Could you so, give a few examples, or get, maybe just one example? Of this, uh, yeah, yes. of the psychi yeah. yeah, the psychology of curiosity. Yeah, this is great. Um, so um, this is a project that I was involved in, and um, what we were interested in is try to, trying to encourage ordin ordinary um, end users to make use of some fancy new um, debugging tools that we had devised for them. And so, as many people are, uh, people were a little um, reluctant to go off and explore new features. When you give them a task like debugging, you know, oftentimes they want to use the intellectual tool set that they have and the features that they know how to use, and so they just do it. Um, and so, here we have these wonderful new features, but how can we possibly get people to use them? And so, uh, we stumbled across this wonderful work about the psychology of information, uh, of, of curiosity, and it really helped us to understand what a strong motivating factor curiosity is. And uh, this work that we read, which was by George Lowenstein, had a particular perspective on curiosity called the information, uh, information gap perspective. And so the idea that he put forth that seemed very consistent with what we've seen is that people think they pretty much know everything that they need to know. And so you do what you do with the idea that you know everything that is necessary for you to do that thing until something happens in your world that reveals the presence of an information gap. And then, if all goes well, you try to explore the information gap. So just as an example that's outside end-user software engineering, suppose you're walking down the street, you think you know everything you need to know about walking, so you're not thinking about walking. You're thinking about something else, like, you know, are we on the right, right route? You know, where are we supposed to be? Am I wearing the right clothes? And then, suddenly you trip. Now, this has revealed the presence of an information gap. You did not, in fact, know everything you needed to know. So, your curiosity is aroused. You know, what do I need to know? <laughs> and what do you do? You look down. What did I trip on? So, here, your curiosity has caused you to take an action to explore to seek information about the thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to reveal the presence of an information gap uh, that would cause them to seek information about the thing. 
So that's how we had devised um, this particular um, aspect of end-user software engineering we were working on. We, uh, we did not try to interrupt people, but when they had gotten to a point where they were telling the computer to do something that was debugging oriented, we did something extra and we painted some things on the screen differently that indicated that there was something in addition to what they'd asked for happening. And we did it that way because we didn't want to interrupt their train of thought. I mean, debugging is hard work, and so if you're on a, on a roll, you don't want the system to be telling you, oh, look over here, but it was available. And so sure enough, uh, what happened in our lab studies is after a certain period of time, after they'd seen this stuff painted for a while, some people would hover over it. And so this also comes back to the psychology of curiosity. When, when the world reveals the presence of an information gap, the place that you seek information is from that thing that shows uh, there's a presence of an information gap, not hiding under some help button somewhere else. Mm. So we put the information about the stuff uh, in tooltips right over the thing so they could hover over it and get this information. So, so we, we developed a strategy called Surprise, Explain, Reward, which is what I've been describing. And I've told you the surprise piece and the explain piece, and then explain's job was to tell why they might want to pursue it, which had the, re the reward piece in it. Um, it's, kind of, it's a little bit tricky because the size of the information gap is very important. Um, it can be too small, and then um, you don't bother to seek information about it. So instead, you're walking down the street, and you know you hear some little bell go off somewhere, and it just wasn't interesting, and you didn't do anything mm. about it. Um, and then the other possibility is it's too big for you want to seek information. And st instead, you're scared to death. So what could happen is you're walking down the street <laughs> and a tidal wave starts coming. And so then you don't try to seek information. You just try to get out of there. <laughs> yeah. And this, of course, can happen in interfaces, too, where people get way too much feedback or, or they get very confused or they're afraid all their work is gone. And then they're mm. not seeking information. They're just running the other way. Yeah. Or if it's on the screen, they just start ignoring some of the text. Right, you know, right. They so just that, don't absorb it. Yeah, there are things that can be too small or too big. So, so um, it's it's challenging to get it just right. But uh, we've had very good success with it when we do get it right. So, ah, okay. But all of that was about one particular yeah. theory, and um, we also have borrowed many theories that have come out of software engineering, and um, and even out of classic computer science. Um, so, for example, one of the things that we have to do in end user development environments is have our additional supports give it, continue to maintain the level of feedback that they're used to. So in so many of these environments, you do something and you get feedback right away, which gives, and so this is what end users expect. This is the way their environments work. For example, in Excel, you put in a formula, you get the answer right away. You don't, you know, run some compile cycle or whatever. In Word, if you write a macro, you run it and right away you see what it does. Uh, and this is true in almost all of the end user environments, the development environments. And so this is a classic computer science problem about how to write our reasoning algorithms that are in our, in our support tools in a way that's completely consistent with this immediate feedback instead of going away and thinking and thinking and thinking. So, so of course we borrow complexity theory from classic computer science, we borrow things from software engineering about uh, static and dynamic analysis, about how you uh, how the system can reason about the elements of the program that the users put together. Uh, many more theories from human-computer interaction and from education about pe how people can learn new features. So minimalist learning theory by Jack Carroll and Mary Beth Rawson was another uh, big influence on many of the end-user development um, methods out there. And then there are also some new methods and theories that have arisen actually within the context of end-user development. And, and perhaps the, uh, the one that is the best known is natural programming. And so that's, that's a method that came out of Brad Myers's team, uh, and it was uh, John Payne's dissertation. And here, the idea was to devise a programming language, and, and later on people applied it to other kinds of languages for end users too, but a programming language in their example that was based on the way end users, ordinary end users, explained problems and solutions. So it didn't try to be a natural language understander, 
but it did recognize the concepts and the vocabulary that people were expressing and say, okay, let's use those as the basis of a programming language. And then um, this has turned out to be a very successful paradigm for devising uh, languages and tools for end users. And so a lot of people have then adopted that as, uh, as methods for, um, for coming up with good ways to support end users in various aspects of development. So long list. Excellent. And there's a lot we didn't mention. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But this is all for the inter for the introduction now, and then you'll go more into depth in the next interviews. So mm -hmm. you'll have lots of time to explain the okay. most important aspects. Okay. So thank you so far. You're welcome. Okay. If you want to know more, you should have a look at our website, where you can watch the other video interviews with Margaret and Christopher. Here you can also find their chapter on end user development, and at our site you can also find many other chapters all written by thought leaders and inventors. Thanks for watching.